Welcome to Raven Talk, the official podcast of the Raven Tribe. The Raven Tribe is a home for warriors on the path and is dedicated to training warriors for the battlefield of life. Visit us on the web at theraventribe.com where you can learn more information on membership, warrior training, as well as links to our official YouTube channel, Facebook group, apparel store, and our official bookstore, Marshall Books. Welcome back, Tribe. Today we're here with special guest Tim Anderson of Infinity Blade Concepts. And today we're going to be discussing his unique approach to blade combat. Tim, how are you doing today? Pretty good, buddy. How you doing? Good, good. Well, glad to have you back on since the last show. Um, we are happy to talk to you and get in a little bit more depth information about the Infinity Blade Concepts program. So, Tim, sure. just to start out, give us a little bit of information. Um, when did Infinity Blade Concepts begin, and you know where did it come from? What what was the uh, development of this program? For me, the beginning was probably about eight between eight and ten years ago. I've been in a mock since '95. Uh, Professor Sotis is, is probably the best knife I think I've ever seen on the planet. But over the last six to eight years or so, it's been hard for me since I've moved away from the New England area and stuff to get back and forth to see him as much as I'd like to. So what I did is a lot of the things I foundationally learned from him with the mock and combined with some of the other Filipino stuff I've done and some of the Navaja, the Tomahawk and Bowie I've done with him and as well as um, Colonel McLemore, things like that. I've kind of moved into a, a, a system that I put together with the blade and the empty hands and things like that. Um, that's the easiest way to explain the foundation of it. Now, you call the program Infinity Blade Concepts, but it's not just blade. You do a lot of empty hand work as well. Right. Can you tell me how the empty hand work plays into the into the blades before we even get started talking about the blade specific material? Sure. Yeah, the empty handed stuff it comes from the blade. In other words, when you look at systems in the Philippines, Southeast Asia, things like that, a lot of systems that are weapon based, that's what you train with first as compared to a lot of times, you know, you do your empty hands and then the weapons and things are an extension of that. When it comes to the way that I teach, as influenced by a, a mock, influenced by some of the Filipino, things like that, we, I concentrate on what the blade does, and then I concentrate on what the empty hands do for me if I don't have a blade in my hand. So a, a lot of those things are built off of the blade, but then they're also is combined with the pot of I've learned, with uh, some of the tie that I did in the 90s, and things as well as I don't do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and groundwork like that. So it, and that is still a baby stage for me. It's just, it's not something I was always heavy into. But as far as the empty hand, you know, it's a combination of those things like that. Some of the uh, Western boxing and the MMA type stand-up is all influenced and used in the blade work. So that way the system is complete because, you know, here in the United States you just can't walk everywhere you want to with the blade, and that is your only means of protection. It's kind of, in the wrong situation, it's frowned upon by the court system. So, you know, we, we use the, uh, a complete system. That way you can protect yourself, you know, from, from, all, from all degrees of what you need to. Now, Tim, one of the interesting things that I, I found about your system, having conversation with you, is that your system is edge-aware. And when I say that, what I mean by that, the audience at home, some of you guys will understand what I'm talking about. There's a lot of martial arts techniques that you can do against somebody that's empty-handed, and they can work fine. But you put a blade into that equation, and all of a sudden, some of those techniques don't make as much sense as they once did when you were dealing with an right. empty-handed attacker. Now, your approach, you're always conscious of that blade, and so all of the techniques are based around that edge awareness, so it's going to function for somebody whether it, the knife is in play or whether it's still an empty hand situation. Can you tell me a little bit about that logic and how you came to that, you know, decision sure. to gear your program that way? Sure. Again, that that part comes from you know, I, I hate to say it, but that comes from my instructor, Professor Sotis. It comes from it comes from how Mox with my influence of that, you have to be aware of any weapon that somebody can carry. Just because somebody is empty handed doesn't mean that they can't access a weapon. Doesn't mean they can't pick a rock up off the friggin' ground. So you have to be aware of what's around. So in order to do that, techniques that you develop and work 
have to be able to be used in that sort of combat. If it can't, then it's going to be difficult. It's not that it won't work. You know, don't get me wrong. You know, empty hand against empty hand is fine and everything, but once that blade comes into the equation, then, you know, all bets are off. You know, it makes it a lot harder. So if you try, if you try to be aware of weapons and be aware of that type of combat as compared to being in a sport, it makes it easier for you. So yes, the techniques and stuff we use, we, I try to keep the blade as aware as possible, whether it's, even if I'm doing the, the Russian martial arts stuff with the tomahawk, with sticks, with anything, because those are things people can't carry. You know, I, all joking aside, I've been camping and, and you know how many hatchets are in a set of woods when you got a hundred campers? And then you get maybe 50 people that are drunk and want to play and act stupid. That hatchet can come up at any time. And yes, I have seen it uh, camping in Pennsylvania. So, it, it's just one of those things about being aware. Now, talking about the blades specifically, the the weapons that are taught in the system, run me through them. Are we looking at, you know, small civilian folders? Are we looking at, you know, full, you know, battle blades, um, machetes, you know, bowies? What kind of weapons are you teaching the students? Uh, basically, D, all the above. Because, you know, you got to have fun with the larger weapons, even though, like, over here in the United States, you're probably not going to carry a bolo everywhere you go. But a machete is very accessible, and you can buy one for 18 bucks at True Value Hardware. Um, hatchets, same thing. Like I said, camping. Those are weapons and things that you can carry and can use. So we concentrate, you know, first with the folder, because that is the most common thing carried in the United States is the folder. A lot of states you can't carry a fixed blade. I think in most all states, if not all, uh, double-edged weapons are illegal. I don't think you can carry uh, double-edged weapons. I, out in Chicago, when I was with my buddy Keith Jennings, he was telling me that you can only have a two-inch cutting blade out there. So when I came out and visited him, I carried my cobalt razor from uh, our Lowe's here that I use on my job site because it's a, it's a folder, and it's barely an inch and a quarter long. I yeah. don't want to run into any trouble. Absolutely. So Chicago you have to be bad. aware that you're, oh yeah, you have to be aware of the laws in the county, your state, and all that stuff too. So I teach for everything because I do travel, and also my students may come in and go to Liberty University here, or they go to a college and they come from other states. So if I'm just teaching them one thing or just showing them one thing like that, and they go back home. It might not be as viable for them because, again, thanks for the blame, it can be you know. Their state could be like Chicago. Their city could be like here where I carry a fork. Or I'm in the south, so it's no use in line. I can get away with carrying just about anything I want for when I'm in the country. But, I mean, it just depends. So the system is resolved around those things, and that's where the sticks come in because the sticks are approximately 24 inches, 25 inches, depending on what type of rattan, what lengths you have, uh, 28 inch. So when we use those, it kind of covers part of the longer techniques, if I'm not training a machete that day or a bolo, we swing and we use the sticks. And that makes it easy in case, <laughs> you know, some people may not want to swing a larger blade. They may feel a little uncomfortable. So I give them the sticks, and it allows them that that luxury of working with something longer. But as well, sticks is a good uh, equational the difference maker if you got a small folder and I got a 28 inch stick and I don't have a blade or I can't get my access to it, I can use those sticks to work, work your arms, work your hands, keep you back in a distance in case I need to either run or get away. Now, Tim, because you're working with weapons that are really diverse, you know, small blades, the large blades, the hatchets, and tomahawks, tell me a little bit about. Uh, you know, each individual weapon, because each individual weapon has its own identity, and I'm sure that each one has its own set of lessons to teach the student. What are some of the things that students can expect to pick up from working with different types of blades, as opposed to working just with one type of blade all the time? Sure. When I, when I teach a striking system, you know, people use, usually use angles of attack or a numbering system. I use almost the same thing that I got from a mod when I use the blade or I use a dagger or whatever, I keep a, a specific striking system and I like things to be kind of center line, kind of in a box. I don't like wide angles and wide movement, especially with a folder or a shorter dagger, because the, the, the more you open up, the more your elbows are away from your body, the more open you are. I don't know if people pay attention to notice that much, but my elbows 
go anywhere from a 30 degree angle or out 20. I, my whole, that angle opens my entire rib cage up. And I always teach my guys, the moment you're striking, somebody's always trying to strike you back or vice versa. I said, because nobody's going to stand there and just let you do the things that we do in practice. So when I teach the striking system with the um, smaller blades, the folder, it's pretty much a lot what I te- have learned with Professor Sotis when it deals with striking. Because I still do a mock, I still love, and I still believe a mock day in and day out. It's, it's been a system I've been with for, uh, like I said, since about August of 95. When I get to the l- little bit larger weapons, the sticks, the bolo, the um, and I, or the Chris, it doesn't, when it gets to that length, the striking system is different. I do practice down the, the center line, so the striking angles are a little bit different because the weapon is a little bit longer. So I teach a different striking system with longer weapons. Usually with the tomahawk and those, I have the, the tomahawk I teach, the striking system I got from Colonel McElmore because I like it and it's also respectful. I've been with him since 2001 to a certain point dealing with, dealing with Tom O'Hane. He was my primary instructor for years with that. When I teach the Falcata, it's the same principle. I keep it in that, uh, the Kukri, same thing. Those numbering systems are there for that reason, or I, like I call a striking system, because numbers get people confused. Angles sometimes get people confused because I always tell people, no matter what weapon you have in your hand, it's like drawing a pencil. I can take and take a canvas and just scribble and write, and that and that blade or that edge is up, and that canvas is all torn to pieces. Anything is an angle. So the numbering system and the striking system I, I teach, I do it because I like to see, if I got a group of 15 or 20 people, I try to keep, keep them doing the same thing so I can stay focused and watch what's going on in the room. It's not that I teach um, angles and striking with each particular weapon as this is, you know, this is it. This is the only way to do it. And that's how you get stuck in a box, and that's also how you can get people hurt. You got to be able to, to them to understand that that weapon is an expression. It's not a number. It's it's not any of those things. It's an expression of what you're taught and what you can do with it. I always tell people who come to me who take tempo, who take taekwondo, whatever, they want to do blade, they want to do other things, I tell them, I'm not telling you what you teach or what your system is is wrong. What I'm giving you is what I do with blade, and that is or a tomahawk or a machete, and you want to add it to what you do, my job is to make you better at what you do, not to tell you what you do is wrong. So for people who I teach that way, I give them the tomahawk, the machete, and a lot of them with, with the kukri, it's the same principle. You take it, you make it yours, you make an expression of it your way. That way, what I've taught you, I know works, and you can use those techniques, but also make your own expression of it. That's the way I was taught with knives. You know, I do it this way, and then I make my own expression and my own individual, you know, individual, however you want to say the word, individualization of what I express with it. Now, Tim, I'm probably going to make some people mad here, but a lot of people claim to teach edge weapons, and they claim to teach huh. knife combat. And what you really get most of the time, in my experience, is they teach you, you know, a 12 or 15 angle cutting pattern, you know, cut and thrust pattern. Right. And if you're lucky, you know, you might get, you know, a single tarot thrown in there. Um, but for the most part, it's kind of limited to that. And there's a lot fewer instructors that I find actually have a full you know, rich curriculum when it comes to knife work. You know, aside from the obvious things that everybody, you know, tries to do, like cutting patterns and, and you know, basic um, entries and things like that, what are some of the things that you work on as far as techniques with the blade? I mean, are you looking at, you know, ambush techniques? Are you looking at, you know, uh, standing grappling techniques, you know, takedowns? What kind of things can a student expect to learn when they're studying with you? Well, for me, the biggest thing I start with is, you know, we, we teach a striking pattern, so you know how to strike with it. You know, I tell everybody it's not it's not complicated, it's not rocket science. You can thrust, slash, and then there's just other little you know nuances you can do with the blade, whether it's the knife or whether it's a, even a tomahawk. Um, from there, I teach uh, we call cross checking, which is a lot of Filipino arts. I learned it even on mock years ago. As far as how we do that, for us, accessing is important as well. 
because you got to be able to get to the blade. you got to be able to pull it out, and whether it's your folder or a, you know, um, a fixed plate. And what we do with that is how you have to train technique. You can practice, you know, cutting ones and twos with each other, as, as a lot of people do when they feed each other these, you know, because in a lot of systems, a one can be a block, a two can be a block, a three can be a block, as well as is a strike. It's the same way with even within the striking system I teach. If somebody sees me a two, I can still cut with a two. I can still cut with my one, depending on where it's at. But what I like to do is the problem I've noticed for you, the system is everybody practices as if the blade is already in your hand. Rarely do I see anybody that teach, you know, here comes an attack. I need to access my blade in that moment. Everybody already practices these cutting patterns, these cutting techniques, and the blade is already in your hand. But you can't just walk around with a blade waiting for somebody to attack you. So you have to practice wearing jeans or whatever you want to wear, but having to be able to get to that blade. And you don't start off, you know, I don't tell anybody, you know, let's go 100 miles an hour and make it real as possible. You first have to learn to get to that blade and then pick your speed up. So when we do sparring and when we do these other things, we, we have steps in it. For example, <laughs> if somebody's seeing me a technique and I need to, and, and somebody might be feeling with an umbrella block, but I'll just say I'm coming up with my blade to cut that forearm and I'm checking it at the same time, right? I'm doing it with it in my hand. I need to work that a lot of times as well as if I'm, I'm caught off guard and I don't have my blade. I may have to hit that arm with a good team, access my blade somehow, soften that person, get to that blade, and maybe do that technique. Start off slow enough to where you practice it and get it. Then, then you have to be able to pick that speed up. Pick that speed up and, and, and everything until that, if that makes sense. And, you know, we practice so much with the blade in hand instead of trying to access the blade and bring it into combat. So we try to change it up a little bit and we go from the accessing aspect to combat. The only other system is a mock. I, I don't refer to that a lot. I've seen a mock do it ever since I've been to, with it since 95. You know, not many systems do that. I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think Marshall Blade Concepts does it a little bit. I think I've seen Keith do it somewhat. But it's something that I've seen a lack in a lot of systems that don't practice. You know, every video I see on YouTube, every one of these things I see people practicing as if they already have the blade in their hand. No, absolutely. And I think that's something that, that you know, it's kind of similar to, you know, people that work on uh, on grappling. Uh, they just kind of, right. let's start on our knees or let's start on the ground. Well, what got you to that point? And so you're absolutely right. Um, you know, shooters will practice, you know, drawing their firearm at nauseam. They don't just, you know, get out there and, and shoot at the paper target and assume they're never going to have to draw that weapon from a from oh, holster. Yeah. So, yeah, it's definitely a lot of truth to what you're saying, and you're right. In, in my experience, has been very similar to yours where I've not seen a lot of people working on that aspect of the training. Very good stuff. Right. Now, Tim, give me a little bit of uh, information about how your program is set up as far as structure. You know, what can students expect if they're coming in to sign up for classes you know, um, what's the time frame? You know, is the person going to be working on a certain skill set for a couple of weeks, a couple of months? Do you have this thing broken down into levels or belts? How does uh, the training progression work? How do you have it set up for the students? Uh, I have thought about using a belt system, but at the same time, I like using the levels. It's, you know, I haven't decided on, like, if I'm going to do four levels or five levels, for me, the most important thing from the beginning is getting students to understand the blade and also being able to defend themselves with the blade. Those things come as I see them progress. You know, like, say, if I do level one, level one might be, all right, you've got the striking system down, you've got, you know, a little bit of skill with the tomahawk, you got a little bit of skill with the sticks or something, and then I, I may test you and get, give you a level one. Level two may consist of that and more. Each level is going to consist of everything that begins with level one because you can build a house on a solid foundation, but if, they, if the foundation ever gets a crack and leaks, your house has problems. And I don't want, you know, that's why I kind of call it infinity because I don't want, you know, I, I, it may sound crazy, but I don't want 
the system to be at a set still. I don't want it to be like, okay, we've achieved this, that's all we need. That doesn't make sense to me. Time grows, time stops for no man. Things evolve. You should watch the MMA world. You go all the way back to the early 90s. Those guys, the foundations, everything they said are great, but if you look at the fighters over the years, they've evolved. They've gotten better. They've gotten quicker. They've gotten stronger. Now, all martial arts systems should be that way. You should be able to progress and evolve into something different when it comes you know, comes to that. So I, I treat my blade and empty hands and everything that way. I try to use a rotating-type curriculum. So every three or four months, something's different. And then by the time we get back to that next year, it gets back to that point. You know, seminars and things are a little bit different. You expect a seminar. You know, I teach, I come in, I do my basics, and then we progress from there. I, I see who who is there. You know, if I have 20 guys that are experts, I'm just going to give them part of the system a little bit, and then we're going to have fun and we're going to learn things. I'm going I'm to look at them and see what they do see if I can add things to that, crisp up some things they do. Because a lot of people are training in blades. A lot of people come to seminars. You, you don't want people to be bored when they get there. You don't want them to go, well, I've seen this a thousand times. I paid 75 bucks or 100 bucks or 200 bucks, and I'm bored. I want my money back. That, that doesn't do anybody any good. So when I show up, I don't have a chip on my shoulder. I've been known to ask people, show me your angles of attack. And I'll work off what they have because I don't need to go into somebody's house and tell them what they do is wrong. So when I go into that atmosphere and you get students and you get people from other systems that do blade, you've you got to be able to conform to them and help them or, you, or, or teach them something maybe they haven't seen or better something they have seen. And the curriculum, you know, I teach the curriculum as it is and then I ask people to come up with their own things. As you get better, I don't care if we'll call it level three, level four, or whatever. I say, okay, I've given you these, the striking system. What I want you to do is I want you to take this striking system and make it yours. I want you maybe, if you want to change a couple of things, change it. I'll look at it. Let's see what we have. Let's see how you teach. Let's see how you progress as far as, okay, what techniques can you come up with? If I throw something at you and you rely on just everything that I teach you, what happens is, you know, say you get a a dislocated shoulder, a dislocated arm, or say you get a disability in your foot and you limp like I do, things have to change. So the techniques I teach have to be used to be able to evolve with my students. That way I don't have to go, well, you know, um, can't do it that way. I, I can't, you know, I can't promote you. I can't pass you. That just doesn't make any sense to me. You should be able to take people and, and whatever, no matter how long they're with you, no matter what they do, your system should be able to work with that person and help them evolve as a martial artist. Now, Tim, let me ask you, what about the other weapons that you teach? Um, do you do a lot of mixed weapons training? Are you teaching people how to use, you know, knife and tomahawk in, in combination, stick and knife, you know, double knives? What, what kind of things are worked on in that aspect? <laughs> From the curriculum standpoint of view, I'm still putting together the double knife aspect. The reason being is because single knife is your most common thing to carry. You know, double knife isn't. But double knife makes your, or double sticks, makes you more of, uh, I don't want to say ambidextrous, but it does enable you to use both hands more. It does enable you to change feet better. So, yes, we do, you know, use the knife aspect like that, maybe sometimes a single stick and a knife. Um, as far as tomahawk, cookery, and all those are specialty. I don't say, hey, you need to be this belt or this level before you can do it. Everything is taught from the beginning. Uh, once a month, once every other month or something like that, I'm saying, let's break every day and let's do a tomahawk. Let's do a cookery. Let's do sticks. Sticks are more added into what I do because it's something I can use in defense against that knife if somebody has one and I don't have mine and I can pick up something and swing it. Um, so with the specialty weapons like that, we say for a different thing. Like I had my buddy Kirk, uh, my old friend who passed away a few months ago, uh, Ken Fringer. You know, we had started and been working with American Frontier Fighting Arts. That's an organization we're trying to build. I got to get back with Kirk more. That has its tomahawk curriculum. If that makes sense, that has its Bowie knife curriculum. Those are the things that I bring in and use with infinity if anybody wants certificates or anybody wants 
anything dealing with the tomahawk and the bowie and stuff like that, or even the kukri, those are added to the curriculum as far as how the system is taught, if, if that makes sense. That way I can, I can see them separately because that is something I do with Kirk, who lives in Ohio, who is a real good friend of mine. Like I said, you know, those are the, how I honor my buddy Ken, who passed away a few months ago, when, uh, stuff that he taught me with Irish stick, uh, even some of the time that I did with him. And even the, um, sometimes we deal with the, the Viking battle axe or the dagger. Those are things that I honor and I keep, keep sacred with my buddy Ken. Like I said, he was a dear friend of mine. And so those are parts of the curriculum that are a little bit separate. That, hey, I like something. If you want to do this, no extra money. I don't get into that aspect of it. But if you want to do this, well, we can work these things. I can keep an eye. We can work the curriculum on that. And I'll, I'll give you a side certificate or whatever, dealing with those. Now, Tim, I know that you're working on really picking up on the seminar circuit and reaching out to bring this, this system to existing schools and helping instructors you know, expand on what they're doing. Um, tell me about what the process is like. If somebody is running a martial arts school, let's say they have advanced knife training or no knife training at all, and they want to offer this to their students, how are you working this process? How are you helping other instructors to, you know, build their schools, build their curriculums, and, and add on to what they can offer their students? Um, well, that, like I said, that's in the baby process. Now, most of the seminars and stuff I've done where I've, I have been to, like, Keith. Um, I've been to San Francisco to, to uh, Paul Tassetti and them. They have curriculums and they have things in place. All I do is, I, you know, I go, I do my the seminars, workshops with them and whatever weapon they want to see. As far as blade, you know, I've done two out there, and they have, like, a 16-hour uh, certificate that I've done for the two days with them. It doesn't enable you to teach or that kind of thing. I'm not one of those that, hey, I'm going to come out for 16 hours, and you're going to be an instructor. I don't believe in that. That's how so many people get hurt. But if, if, it's a, if it's something that somebody wants to add to what they do, it doesn't matter the school, I come out and I give you the base part of the curriculum. We do the striking system. We do some of the block type stuff, some of the accessing, and I teach you sparring. Because to me, sparring is the most important aspect of any system, especially with blade and especially with what I teach. Because that's how you learn how you get hit. That's how you learn what you do wrong is you take what you do and bring it to the table. Then we go back into training and we develop ways of not getting hit and then going back and sparring. So what I do is when I go to a school, I teach a few levels of sparring. We have slow sparring, which is kind of like random exchange. I feed you something. You feed me something. We know it's one for one. And then we feed it from a random area where nobody knows where it's coming from. Basically, you you just fake and strike. You hit. You do what you want to do. I don't I don't need to know. I don't need to see that big arm raised up like you're coming down with a number this. You know what I mean? Everybody, they 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 let you see what's coming so you can work a defense against. They let you. When we do the sparring aspect, even in slow sparring, I may move and I may fake and come back with something else because I want your reaction. Because that's the most important thing is the reaction. So when I go to places that want things, I need to be able to not be there, but know that they're doing these aspects to train themselves. And then I'll go back, or they can send me a video, and I can see what's going on as far as progression. But the beginning thing is, you know, you want your striking system and the sparring, and then we build that foundation from there with the blocking, the you know, any of the, the uh, react, we try to keep our drills a little bit more alive. I haven't done a basic, you know, having six or any of that kind of stuff for forever in a day. It's just not my thing. People, you know, I tell you, if you want those kind of drills and things like that, I'm more than happy to make you do one or two, but that's not how you fight. It's, it's, it builds, uh, some of those drills build bad habits. And I don't want to build bad habits in the training. So what I've done is I've tried to eliminate some of those things and get more into the reality aspect of, okay, how can we make our sparring better? So the drills and things like that deal with coming off of sparring. And that's how I present it to a school or present it to somebody so they can grow from it and 
or start their own group. I've worked with Tom Badia in San Francisco, and we'll try to get it there early next year and keep corresponding with him about building the curriculum for him to teach out there. Great. Now, Tim, if people want to reach out to you and get involved with what you're doing with Divinity Blade Concepts, if they want to sure. work with you, you know, be mentored by you, brought up in the system, what's the best way to reach you? Um, I got it. I got the Infinity Con uh, Infinity Blade Concepts page on Facebook. I'm not a I'm not real good with Facebook and stuff. I do check it every now and then. It's the one thing I'm not great at. But you have my phone number. You're more welcome to give it to anybody. It's four three four. 509-9918. Um, my email is E-S-K-R-I-M-A-66. That's a Hotmail account. Um, if you need to contact me through, you know, through you, you, you're more welcome to put anybody in contact with me. I'm hoping to get these things done so I can, you know, come out your way here in a couple months once I get with Billy and able to build these pamphlets and stuff like that. I'm still learning some aspects of how to promote myself. That's, you know, that's the big thing. I love to teach. I love what I do. I love to make people better at what they do, whether it's empty hands, blade, and focus mix. It doesn't matter what it is, you know. And that's, I think, you know, I didn't even mention that. One of the things that I do with blade, I did it out with the setting and ends and stuff like that. Part of the curriculum I deal with, with blade also deals with focus mix and pads. I don't know how many instructors out there. I haven't seen too many. But I deal with focus mitt training a little bit with the blade. So in other words, you got a focus mitt in one hand and blade in another, and I'm feeding you, and you're coming at me. So I'm using focus mitts and training that way so you get used to something coming back at you. So in other words, I'm not just throwing a, a number of this at you. I might throw a strike and then come back with that focus mitt and try to pop you upside the head while you're trying to deal with the blade. Or I may throw a small sublot kick or a shoot kick, or I may throw a tie kick or an elbow, so a small elbow, you know, something that's going to make you react to that blade. I didn't mean to get off track, but I did forget to mention that. And to me, that's kind of important in my system. I think it's a little bit different than what some people do. Some people will either like it or they don't like it. But my goal is to better my students and to get a reaction. And when you get a reaction, I have to throw things at you. Nice. But, yeah, you can contact me any way you want to and, and, and everything. And I hope to set up something with you soon to come out there. Excellent. Well, we'll definitely be in touch, and I encourage everybody out there listening to definitely reach out and to get in touch with you for training. It's been great talking to you, Tim, and we'll be in touch sure. soon. You bet, man. Thank you so much, man. I, it's a privilege. Thank you. Great, Tim. Thank you again. You take care.